So, what I'd like us to do today is to solve a problem. Here's the problem. The problem is, I want to deliver a message to a gentleman named Vazgen. You probably know him as your teaching assistant. Tall, good looking guy, you know. <laughs> so, the question is, how do I deliver a message? Well, in any delivery system, think of your mail system, right? You have to know the address of the person that you're sending a package to, right? Well, I don't know where Vazgen is. But I do know that I want to deliver a message to Vasquez, right? So what I'll do, I will create a message. In this message, I will say, so this message is saying, please give me the address for Vasquez. And what I will do then is I will send this, I will deliver this message to a person whom I know. And that person is going to be you. Yes. Close enough. Okay. So now let's pretend you know where Vosgen is. Let's pretend you do. Vosgen specifically, and I'll tell you this, happens to be sitting on the eighth row, fourth seat. Right? Okay. So you will pretend to write down eight and four and launch it back to me. <laughs> okay, all right, good. So now what I've just done is I've figured out or I've resolved Vosgen's address. Okay, remember that word, resolved. This, is, this process that just happened is known as a resolution. So I have resolved his address from his name. So given his name, I got his address. Great. So now I know that I need to deliver a message to the address, specifically in this case, eighth row, fourth seat. With me so far? Good. So the next thing I'll do is I will create another packet where I will write down to whom I want to send the package to. So I'll write eight. And four. Okay. So now, what I can do though is I can only send this message to people who are close to me. That is to say, people who I know, people who are neighbors, right? So I can't reach all the people back there, but I can reach. <laughs> Just give it to her because I threw it to me. Okay. So I can reach you. Now, what you can do is you will open up, pretend to open the, the package that I just sent to you. Yeah, don't actually. Open. And then you'll say, oh, okay, well, I don't know Vazgen. Like, Vazgen is not that close to me because I'm on the first row, right? But so you know, you have neighbors around you, right? You, there are people who you know, the person next to you, the person behind you. So given that address, and given the people who are around you, to whom would it be optimal to pass that mail to? Yeah, very good. Watch out for her eye. Don't hurt her. Okay, good. So you will throw it to your neighbor who is sort of in the direction, right, of Vazgen, who has an address that is closer to the target. Good. That neighbor will in turn repeat. This is sort of a recursive algorithm, if you will. So go ahead and repeat. Go ahead and repeat. Go ahead and repeat. You can just throw it. You're close enough. Pretend, pretend Vazgen is like your neighbor and just throw it to him. <laughs> All right, yeah, awesome, very cool. So now, so now, suppose I want to do the same thing tomorrow. So Vazgen comes in, sits in the exact same location, or maybe he changes it, but when I ask for the resolution, when I resolve his location, I find out the new location where he's sitting. I want to now deliver the same thing or a different message to him, but you are not there. You were sick that day, and maybe you weren't there, right? How can I deliver a message to Vazgen if you were not there? Yeah, exactly. I can just throw it to somebody else, right? And that somebody else can just throw it to somebody else. That is to say there are many paths that we can use, right, to deliver a message from here to there, right? This is an example of what's known as a fault tolerant system. 
That is to say, it is a system that can tolerate failures. A failure in this case are people who are missing, right? Nodes or routes, if you will, routers that are missing. Now, each one of you who then took one of these packages and then sent it to someone else, what you are doing is known as routing. Routing, that's what that's called. Routing is just a fancy way of saying passing a message to one to a specific location, right? So you get the message, you know you have lots of neighbors, you know lots of people, and you make a decision as to which direction that mail should go to. That's known as routing. And the, the, the devices that do this are known as routers. Okay? So in this example, every one of you who then took a packet, sent it to someone else, took a packet, sent it to someone else, you were pretending to be routers. And you were routing my message from my location, my device, to Vosgen which is the target device. With me so far. The second thing that you, you noticed, of course, is that we can choose different routes. So what this means is that if individuals are missing, if the configuration, if you will, of this room changes, that's to say people move around, some people are not here, new people come and join the class, the system will continue to work. It will eventually find a path from me to Boston. Clear? Mm -hmm. So this is what the internet was actually developed for. The internet originally was a research project to tr attempt to build a fault tolerant system. The idea, it was actually, I think, uh, funded by the military at the US. Um, and the goal of this was very simple. If a bomb was dropped in the US, mm -hmm. could they continue sending messages? Would the, the messaging system, the mail system, the digital mail system, continue to work even after catastrophic failures happened, right? So this was a strategic move in order to try to build this kind of a network. And as you can see from a very simple example, that this kind of network will actually work. Because if something were to happen <laughs> to certain individuals, the, the packet or the, the package that I'm sending would still find its way to the target location. Clear? Okay. So the internet, of course, works a little bit differently but actually very similar to what I just described. So with the internet, yes? So actually you need some people, some known to people to, to deliver your message to Vosgen. Yes, yes. There is not only you and Vosgen, there is Vosgen. So assuming that Vosgen is not my neighbor or very close to me where I can just pass it to him, so let's say he's way back there, then yes, I need enough nodes or enough routes, routers in between to get the message out to him. Yeah, exactly. And it's a good idea to have enough routers so that if some of the routers go away, other routers are still kind of around him, right? Very good. Okay. And yes. what if all the classes missing and in the unequivocal mode are your class game only? So that would be a problem. So that's when, so uh, you know how they say, uh, who turned off the internet? So the reason why you can't turn off the internet is because there are so many nodes or these sort of things that can route your packages all over the world. And while, yes, you could theoretically go and wipe out, as you said, all of them except me and one other computer, realistically, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, good question, though. Uh, other questions? OK, so let's continue. So uh, the address that I was using to uh, locate uh, Vosgen in this example was his row, right, and the seat number. So it turns out that on the internet, what we have is just a number. It's a 32-bit number, okay? And it looks something like this. So you have some number, dot, some number, dot, some number, dot, some number, right? Each one of these numbers is eight bits. Eight times four is 32. By the way, what do you call an eight-bit number? A byte, yeah. So this is actually four bytes. 32 bits, four bytes, same thing. Right? Okay. Um, so it turns out, though, that remembering these numbers, these addresses, is difficult. Right? If I were to ask you uh, 66. You know, 228. Whatever, you're not going to know that's Facebook. Right? So instead, what you do, but if you know the name of the domain that you want to go to, just as I knew that I want to deliver a message to Vazga, I went through a process of resolving his location, right? 
I went through a resolution process by which I asked you, you then notified me of his address, and then I was able to send a package to Basket. In the same exact way, there is a system known as DNS, Domain Name System. And the domain name system does exactly this. It's basically her, right? So I say, I want to find Facebook. I send it to a domain name server. The system then has a mapping between the name and the number. It's that simple. Now there is a bit more complexity to that in the sense that the server actually has other servers. So if it doesn't know, it then asks other servers and so on. There's a process here. But the point is eventually the mapping is resolved and I get back an address. And once I get back an address, suppose this is my phone, I then send a request. Now, a request in this universe, in the universe of the internet, is known as a packet. In Armenian, it's like patet. Yeah? It's a packet. Okay? So remember that word, packet. Now, a packet basically has two parts to it. It has the header, and it has the actual payload. The payload is where you put the actual stuff you want to send, whether it's an image or an email or whatever it is that you're sending. The header information contains lots of things, including from and to, the from address and the to address. Okay? So I figured out that Facebook has that funky address, right? So 66, 220, blah, 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 right? So what I will do is, well, not I, but a program, will in the header of the packet, right, send this packet to that address. That packet will then go through my internet service provider, right, this is the service that, you're, that you usually pay every month to get internet, UCOM or whatever, and it will eventually, going through a network of, of these uh, routers that we discussed earlier, eventually route its way here, okay? And then in a similar way, Facebook could send a packet back to me. Because as we've established, just as I can send a message to Vazgen, Vazgen, if he knows my address, can simply send the message back to me. Is that good? So this is an example of the routing system that we discussed just now. So you have your client computer, and you can have another computer on the internet, which let's just call it a server for now. It doesn't matter. It's just another device. And when you send a packet, it can then go through a series of routes and eventually find its way here. Now, note one thing, that the size of the packet is fixed. These paper airplanes were made from sort of a standard Right, the, the kind that you use in a printer. Right? So that means that I can only write so much on a single piece of paper. True? But suppose I wanted to send Vazgen a book. This would be a problem, right? So that means I can't just send him one thing, one paper airplane. Instead, what I have to do is I have to break up the book into parts and copy parts of the book on different pieces of these airplanes and then send them one at a time. With me? The other thing that you might notice is that if I send it to them a bunch of times, uh, the paper airplanes, all of them, may not go the same route. One may go this way, another may go that way. In fact, one of the key features in routers is not only figuring out which neighbor to send, but it's also trying to optimize how it sends it. That is to say, if it notices that it sent too much information down to one other computer, the load is pretty large on that computer. So it can actually route some in the other direction. So it can balance their load. So one computer does not receive all the messages, because that ends up being very heavy process, as far as processing and memory. Right? So we can balance the load by routing to different neighbors. So for example, where you routed it to her, you could have just as easily next time routed it to her and then maybe to her, right? And then eventually the packets would appear in their target location. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, Absolutely. Uh, 
so router, so good question. So the question was, can a router understand the message and based on the message, figure out where to go? So routers are not supposed to be reading the content, the body of the content. And in fact, if you're using any, and this is, this is not at the internet layer, this is at the application layer, but if your content is encrypted, and we'll talk about encryption in this class very soon, uh, they can't read, literally, it's just a bunch of garbage. So all they can do is read the header information. And so whatever decisions they make would have to be based on just what's in the header. Is that okay? Great. Okay, so that mechanism by which we figure out an address and then sort of go through and propagate the, the packet, if you will, from router to router and get to where we want to go is known as an internet protocol. Protocol is just a fancy way of saying rule. That's it. So whenever you see protocol, something, something, P, protocol just means rule. It's just something that everyone agrees on, okay? So you agree that you will follow a certain mechanism whereby if you get an address like this, you know who to route to. You follow the same, you follow the same, you follow the same, and therefore the packet eventually arrives at its destination. Again, the address looks like this, right? You have sort of an 8-bit number, 8-bit number, 8-bit number, and an 8-bit number. So in total, you have 32 bits. How many addresses, take a wild guess, can you represent using 32 bits? Which gives us? Uh, it's four. Four, 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 yeah. four, four, four billion. Four billion, yeah. It's a little over, yeah, good. So it's slightly over four billion, okay? So that's a lot, right? That's a lot of addresses. But how many phones do you have, right? How many computers do you have? And that's just you, right? There are businesses that have lots of computers, lots of devices. There are other devices now coming online, like refrigerators can now send messages, right? This notion of internet of things, where other devices, not just phones and computers, can now actually send messages to the internet, right? So as we're getting more and more devices online, it turns out that just having 32 bits is not enough. Now, this, uh, the standard for this was version 4. So, Internet Protocol, or IP version 4, is what uses the 32-bit the combination. Now, we're slowly transitioning to IPv6. That is to say, Internet Protocol version 6. Now, in that case, instead of having 4 bytes, we're going to have 6 bytes. Notice we're skipping a version. There's no V5. We went from V4 directly to V6. So version 6 has 6 bytes. And that covers, it's, it's a huge number. It's every grain of sand in the entire world can have its own private IP address. That's how big that number is. It's very big. So we're slowly transitioning to that. Questions so far? So again, this IP address is nothing more than a number, which is the mechanism by which we represent an address. So an address is just a 32-bit number. Later, it will be 128 bits, but that's it. Clear? Good. OK, so we talked about domain name resolution. And again, it's nothing more than going from a domain name like facebook.com or aua.com AM or whatever, figuring out what the actual address is, that number, that 32-bit number, so that then we can actually send a packet directly to that address. Good? Okay, so now, question. Vosgen, let's say, let's say this is actually a very big room, and I can't even see Vosgen. And I send a packet Ooh, I think Vosgen made this one. This is good. Okay. So I'm sending a packet to Vosgen, right? And in fact, I'm not just sending him one. I'm going to send him a bunch because I happen to be sending him, say, a picture. Now, a picture is nothing more than a bunch of pixels represented in bits, right? So imagine a picture really underneath as just being a long string of bits, okay? So what I can do is chop that up into smaller numbers of bits and write them on individual airplanes or packets, if you will. 
and send them to Bosgen, who will then collect all of that information and stick it back together and get the image, right? Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Do you have to send an uh, additional package, uh, the, the tutorial, how to stick the package? Together or not? That's a good question. So the format, so no. But I do have to send in the header the kind of file that I'm sending, right? So I'll say it's like a JPEG or it's a whatever, and that gives him further information about how to stitch things together. But no, in fact, it doesn't, no matter what I send him, think about it this way. It doesn't matter what I send him, whether it's text or underneath, it's just bits, right? And stitching bits together it doesn't matter whether it's an image or anything else, you're just putting numbers together. You see what? So in that sense, it's not a different algorithm for, sti for stitching images versus stitching text. It's just putting in bits. Make sense? Awesome. Okay, so I want to send Vazgen uh, some messages. So again, I sort of, okay, so, you know, go ahead and start passing it to him. Okay, good. Yeah, don't be afraid to catch. Okay, good. All right. All right, so I'm sending him all these sort of messages, right? All right, so, okay, okay, hang on. So, what you will notice, though, is that as I start launching these messages, right, messages can actually get lost in the process, as you may have just noticed, right? They may get lost because people just don't feel like passing them along. But realistically, on the actual internet, they can get lost for lots of reasons. If you think about it, there's lots of hardware, right? There are actual computers or routers sitting between me and Boston, right? Well, these computers can fail. They can lose power, right? There can, uh, wires can get cut, right? All kinds of, you know, someone can walk and accidentally trip a wire, right? <laughs> All kinds of things can happen where a packet won't actually make it to Vosgen, right? Okay, so all the internet, the, I, the internet protocol simply says, give me a packet, I will eventually route it to Vosgen. That's all it gives us. It gives us nothing more. If we want a level of reliability on top of this, where if I send him an email, I want to make sure he actually gets the email. If it gets lost, it's a problem, right? Consider a banking transaction. What happens if that gets lost, right? There are lots of things you can imagine where if the information I'm sending Vosgen doesn't make it to Vosgen, that's a serious, serious problem. So can anyone offer me a solution? How can I make sure that Vosgen got the message? You will get some message from Vosgen that you received it. You will be notified that it got the message. Exactly. From whom? Exactly. So I will receive what's known as an acknowledgement. It's yes, I received the message. Right? So exactly. So what I will do is I will send the packet out. It will go through, propagate through a network, reach Vazgen. He will then generate a packet back to me that says, hey, by the way, I got the message. Thank you. Now, either of those packets can get lost. That is to say, he may not receive a packet at all. He may receive a packet, but then the packet he sends me as an acknowledgement can get lost, right? Or the best scenario is he gets it and I get it and everything is damn, right? So what that means is you have to understand that he may receive duplicate messages from me, right? If I send it to him, but then the acknowledgement he sends back gets lost, I'll go, I should probably send him again because it probably got lost. And so I send him another, right? Not knowing if he actually got the message or not. So that means Vazgen has to account for this. He has to account for duplication. The other thing he has to account for, suppose I'm sending him an image. Remember that an image can be broken down into packets, right? And as I send these packets, he may not receive them in the order in which I sent them. Do you see how that might happen, right? Remember that these packets can go off with different routes, right? There might be traffic congestion, there, all kinds of things can happen. Or it can simply, one of the earlier packets can simply choose a route that takes slightly longer than a packet that I sent after. And so the other thing he has to account for is order. And so if I'm sending him packets, 
what can I do to make sure that when he when the packets arrive, he can put them back together right. in the yeah. right order? Ordering the order. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 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 In the packet, in the header, I can specify order. So that when he receives the packet, he can read the header and say, oh, this is actually, you know, the fifth thing I'm supposed to get. I haven't gotten the fourth. Let me wait until the fourth, and then I'll stitch them together and eventually get what I want. Very good. Very good. Okay. The other thing I want to account for is I don't want to flood the network. So imagine this is a network. Right? So an inter a bunch of computers connected together is known as a network. I don't want to flood the network with messages. So what I do instead is I say, I'm going to send, say, the first five messages. Let's say I have 20. I'm going to send the first five. So I line up the airplanes and I start launching the first five. And it's not until I've received the acknowledgments or haven't and it times out. So I wait for a while and if I don't receive an acknowledgement back, I resend the message, right? Once I receive them, I then move on and send the next one, right? So this is like a window that keeps sliding along where I send things, and as I receive, I move the window, I send things, I receive, I move the window. This is actually known as a sliding window algorithm. Uh, I actually implement this in C++ way back when I was your age. Yeah. Um, so, but that's a low level thing, don't worry about that. What matters is that I don't send everything at the same time, right? I send a little bit, and then once I've received the acknowledgements, I then send more, and then send more, and then send more, right? That entire set of rules that we just established, where I send a packet to him, he sends me an acknowledgement, right? That all of those things that we agree on is a protocol, right? As are all the protocols. This specific protocol is called TCP, okay? So TCP is known as a reliable protocol, okay? So it's a protocol that you would use when you absolutely want to be sure that the message gets to where it's going. Yes? And what if he receives the same message twice? He has to account for that and simply throw it away, but send me... Yeah, that's okay. So he'll receive the message. He won't use it because he already has an existing one, but he will send me an acknowledgement saying, yes, I got it, assuming that maybe his original acknowledgement was lost. Make sense? Yes. Can we take box and put there all, all the paper plane and send it you know, like a box? Good question. So, no. So, remember there's a protocol, right? And that protocol has a set of rules. And one of the rules is the size of the packet. And the packet is fixed, right? Uh, so this is why you can't. So if you want to send more than that size, you end up sending more packets. Hmm? Yes? Can we zip the picture? So we... Absolutely. So zipping is nothing more than taking a bunch of bits, finding, this is a very primitive answer, but finding combinations that repeat, right? And then basically compressing it so that you don't repeat the same set of bits. Instead, you, you do something smaller, and you say, that means this. And then when they receive it, you can just replace it and get back the original image. Uh, that's, I mean, compression is a bit more than that, but that's the basic idea. But the idea is, but at the end of it, you still end up with bits. The output of a zip is still bits. So you're still sending bits. Make sense? Sorry? How does it mean that there are things that you can are there things, okay, so we can discuss compression maybe, that's a separate topic, we'll, we'll discuss compression later. Uh, other questions about the internet protocol, yes? That's right, very good. Very good question, very good question. Okay, so there is an unreliable protocol called UDP, okay? So with UDP, I sort of fire and forget, right? I sort of send the thing and Forget about it. Let's send it, forget about it. Send it, forget about it. Send it, forget about it, right? Oh, I should say one more thing. With TCP, you have to establish a connection, which is nothing more than me sending a packet saying, I want to talk to you, Vasquez. He sends me back, okay, I send him back, yay. And then I send him packets. That's it. it doesn't, and then when we break the connection, it's the same thing. I say, I don't want to talk to you anymore. He says, fine, I don't like you either. I send him back, good, and then it breaks, right? So, 
Uh, but that, that's not that important. With UDP, there's no establishment of the connection. There are no acknowledgments. Okay? So when he receives a packet, he doesn't send me back, yes, I got the packet. So that doesn't happen. Right? I just send him packets one after the other. And if a packet gets lost, meh. <laughs> now you asked a very good question. When might UDP be more useful than TCP? Oh, one more thing. One more thing. Yeah. One more thing. So with UDP, remember, we have this notion of a window. We don't flood the network with everything. We only send them this part and make sure that it arrives, and then we move on, right? With UDP, you don't do that. You just, whenever you want, you, right? you send it along. So when might be a good idea to use UDP rather than TCP? Network is limited. What else? Skype. Skype. Very good. What else? Yeah, any kind of voice. Because if you think about it, if I say ABC, you get ABC, right? Now suppose you get ABC. You're not going to go back and fix the B, right? I mean, it's a conversation. It, it goes forward. You're not going to go back. If you got B, how is that going to help you? Imagine looking at a, at, a, at a video and you're receiving frames from YouTube, right? If you miss a frame, going back and fixing that frame doesn't help because they've already watched it. They're moving forward. Right? So what you want instead is to constantly get the stream. You always want you don't want to wait until every frame has arrived and then move the window and then move, send more frames. Then the, the video will get all choppy and weird. Same thing with voice. Mm. Right? So with UDP, it's used for just streaming things, right? So voice, video, any kind of sort of animate games, right? If you want to sync games and you want to stuff to just come in so your soldier moves around. And if your soldier jumps a little bit. That's better than it sort of not moving because you haven't received the previous packet, right? You can kind of see it. So two protocols, TCP and UDP. These sit on top of the internet protocol. So the internet protocol, again, simply says, give me a packet, I will route it to where it needs to go. That's it. Here's the standard for the address, here's how I will route it, done. TCP and UDP sit on top of that. It's another layer that then uses the internet protocol in order to not only find its location, but also in order to be reliable, or in the case of UDP, not reliable. Is that clear? Yes? Good. So, for a long time, what we had was the inter internet, right? The internet came first. And with the internet, again, all we could do really is just send each other data. Bits, if you will. This gentleman here is Tim Berners-Lee. He's known as the father of the World Wide Web. So before him, or I should say before he decided to do what he did, and we'll discuss that in a moment, scientists in the US and elsewhere were communicating with each other using the internet. So it was there well before the World Wide Web, well before this notion of web pages and links and all this other stuff that you guys now use. Uh, but the problem is they were just sending bits. The question is how were these bits created? What programs were they created with, right? What operating systems were, were these programs sitting on? So imagine you're a researcher and you create some you know, interesting paper about I don't know, molecules. And you did it in some weird operating system that I don't have, using some weird program that I've never even heard of. If you send me those bits, those are useless. I don't have that program that I can use to see those bits, right? Mm -hmm. As an image or whatever, right? So this was the problem, is there were not standards. The, the content that was getting shipped around the internet was not standardized. This was the problem that Tim Berners-Lee saw while he was working at CERN in Geneva. Um, and what he, what he thought was, wait, why don't we, instead of sending around all these weird formats, why don't we just agree on one? Let's keep it very simple. And then let's have a program that, or once we have the set of standards, then programs can be written, browsers, if you will, that can understand these formats and can surface them to the user. And that's precisely what he did. So what he did is he came up with a set of rules 
a set of protocols, if you will, to standardize the stuff that was on the internet. And that gave rise to the World Wide Web. So we talked about TCP and UDP, right? That was the layer that was sitting on top of the internet protocol, which was simply a routing mechanism. Well, it turns out on top of that, there's another protocol called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Now, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol has a series of actions. The typical ones that most people know and use are GET and POST. There are others. There's PUT, DELETE, and others that you probably won't use ever. But it's worth knowing that they exist. So let's have a look at how this stuff might work. Okay, so let me open up the browser. So first of all, do you remember the slide where uh, we had the address for Facebook? Uh, yes. Yeah. What, you, seriously, you memorized it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a picture. Hang on, six. Okay, you remember 66. You remember two, 220. You remember 146, and you remember 36. Good. Okay, go. <laughs> Can you tell I come prepared? So if I go to it. Oh, it's going to take me to Facebook.com. You can see, okay, you're not going to see my Facebook. <laughs> you saw that it went to Facebook.com, right? Okay, so you see that it works. So that stuff that you put in the address is not just a domain. The domain actually gets resolved to that number, which then goes off to, to Facebook and then brings down or downloads content that we see. So let's get an example of how this works. Let's go to something like Apple.com. But before I do, let me open up the dev tools in Chrome. So um, in here, notice there's a network tab. So far, we've used the sources tab and the console tab, right? The console is when you do a JavaScript, you know, console.log. That's where it gets written. The sources tab is where we have our debugger. Remember that? Well, there's a network tab. So let's go to uh, Apple. Apple.com. Apple Let's see what happens. Do I have a network connection? Yes. Yes, I do. Why is Apple.com taking so long? Okay, it's kind of coming. Sort of? Okay. So you see all this stuff down here? These are the requests that are being made to the Apple server. So I know their address, right? Because I went through the DNS resolution, right? Where I went and I said, hey, give me the address for apple.com. It gave me back some number. I then used that number to reach the Apple server. So here is the first request. Let's open it up. Okay, so in this request, here's some header information, right? So you can see that I want to get the information from this address. And, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Hang on. Uh, wow. How do I get How do I hide this? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Can you see? Can I, people in the back, you can see? Yes? Okay, good. So you can see here, uh, there's some information. Um, so here's the remote address. You guys know what that is. That's the IP address, right? The internet protocol address, 32-bit number that we discussed. Uh, this is the actual domain address from which we resolve the number. And the get is the action. So what we're saying here is we want to get some information, right? And the response, ah, it routed us, it, it said moved to whatever, and it routed us to apple.com. Here we go. And it, it came back with a 200, which is just a fancy error message or message that says everything happened great. One second. And in the response, you can see there's a bunch of HTML. So what that means is that this request went to the server, 
to the Apple's server. Now, a server is nothing more than a computer. So Apple has a computer. <coughs> I know that's funny, but Apple has a computer. I contact that computer because I know their address. And I say, hey, Apple, send me information. And it says, OK, and it sends me the information, and here is the information. And the information in this case, of course, is the HTML page that then my browser renders or draws for me on the screen. Well, there was a question. Yes? Can you open the remote address? Can I open the remote? Yeah. What is that AT after the remote? Ah, very good question. That's the port number. And I'll, I'll talk about what the port number is very, very soon. But so this part is the IP address. This is the port number. And I will, I'll tell you what that is very soon, I promise. Yes? Why didn't it work in the first one without the three algorithms? So, uh, so there was, again, this is part of a protocol, but it's too low level. I don't want to discuss it. But basically, if you want to say, OK, my address is actually this one, now use this, you can send this, it's like a redirect. It's saying, go to here instead of here. And when the browser gets it, it goes, oh, OK, and then sends it to there. Which is why you have two requests here. You have a request here, gets it, and goes, oh, oops. And then that's the second request that goes here. The response was, so there was no payload. There was no data. It was just something in the header that came back. And the header, you notice, has the status code 301, move permanently. Right there. It's in the response header. So the response is also a packet, right, which has a header. And that header is this, which has a location. As, so it's not in the body. It's not in the content. It's in the header. There is no, no content. All it's telling me is it, I moved. Go here. OK. And I go there. If this is a little confusing, don't worry. This isn't actually that important. Um, I just want you to understand the mechanism by which you can make an HTTP request and get a response. That's it. If you understood that, we're good. Yeah? Okay. All right, we can also do a post. So a post is nothing more than another thing in the header that says, by the way, what I tip so post is typically used to write something to the server. So if you want to, let's say, fill out a form, and then you want to submit that form, the protocol for that would be HTTP post. There is a slight difference between a get and a post. With a get, the arguments that you send, and we'll talk about the arguments very soon, but the data, if you will, that gets sent, gets put into the URL, gets put into the address that gets sent. So that means anyone who gets your packet can read the arguments. When would it not be a good, what kind of data would you, should you never send? Huh? Exactly. Don't send like your passwords as arguments to a get. That would be a bad idea. With a post, on the other hand, the content that you send goes into the body. And the body can be encrypted and it doesn't have to be visible. It's not in the URL. So the URL just says where to go, but the actual stuff that you're sending is in the body, it's in the content of the packet, which we can encrypt. Is that clear? Okay. Let's go back to our slides. Okay. So the next thing is the HTTP server. So we talked about what HTTP is. It's this mechanism that typically, by the way, sits on top of TCP. Okay? Usually you use TCP underneath to send HTTP requests, which has this notion of a get and a post and a few other things. Right? Well, when you make an HTTP request, that is to say you send a packet to a computer using HTTP, that computer has to understand what to do. Right? How to respond to you. So the software or the program that is written to understand how to respond is known as an HTTP server. 
So a server is just a program sitting on hardware, on a computer. Sometimes you call the computer itself a server, but really any computer can behave like a server as long as it has this program. And the program is very simple. It's just sitting there. It gets a request, reads it, and then sends a response. It serves a response, if you will. That's why it's known as a server. It's an HTTP server because specifically it's designed to understand HTTP requests and deliver HTTP responses. Simple? Good. HTML. Hands up if you know what HTML is. I'm amazed that not everyone is raising their hands right now. It was the first homework assignment. Huh? Yeah, it's a non -grade, non graded homework assignment. That's why the half of you didn't do it. Really. Okay, so HTML is the format, the file format, that basically allows you to specify tags that give the browser or this application that we're using hints to, so it understands how to draw the stuff that it's been sent. That's it. If you just send it regular text like ABC, it will draw ABC. But as you add tags, it will understand sort of um, how to draw these ABCs, okay? And then we have a notion of CSS, right, which will allow us to specify style. Hopefully a lot of this rings a bell because you all know it, of course. So I'm going to skip this because you should know it. For those of you who did not do the homework, highly recommend you learn this because we are, I'm going to just assume you know it and move forward. And if you don't know it, you're going to be stuck. So learn this and learn CSS on your own. Okay, so the application or the program that is used in order to communicate with the World Wide Web, I should say one of them, the typical one, is known as a web browser. A web browser is this fancy window that you guys all use, know and love, Chrome, Firefox, right? All these. I won't mention the third one. Um, so this is a browser. This is a browser. It's one of the earlier browsers. It's a browser I'm guessing many of you have not used. But it's, it's driven by the command line. So remember the command line, that dark window that you all hate? Yes. CMD. Yeah. Right, CMD. So the original applications for web browsing were written inside of that, right? So what you would do is you would say, I want to go to this address, and then it would pull down the HTML and draw the HTML as text. Now, certain things are missing here. Can anyone tell what's missing? Right, images, right? is the obvious one. Some styling, they have some basic styling, right? You can see they already had a notion of a list. Right? They had a notion of like bold and underline, right? So they had sort of some very primitive tags, but it was very limited, right? So this was the earlier version of a browser. Later, Mosaic came out. So Mosaic, I believe, was from University of Berkeley. Uh, it, was a, it was based on a research project, and they, as you can see, it's starting to look more like the kind of browsers that you use today. It's actually a window that has an address bar, and look, ta-da, it's got an image. This was revolutionary. Uh, and then, after, then, eventually, Mosaic was productized and became what some of you may have heard of, known as Netscape Navigator. Okay. So, a few things about how the browser used to work. So the browser... Uh, it has a notion of layout, okay? So layout means it needs to figure out where to put stuff on the screen. In order to lay anything out, you have to know the size of the pieces that you're laying out, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that means that in order to lay out this or to lay out that, the browser needs to know the size of that and that, yes? Now, in HTML, when it comes down, doesn't have, typically, the image baked into it. 
what it has is an image tag, I'm sure some of you have worked with this, an image tag that has a source, which is a reference, it's a URL, from which the browser then has to go and download the image, again using an HTTP GET protocol, right? So what would happen? Well, when you download the HTML page, it would not render, because the browser does not know how to lay it out. What it would then do is it would go and find the image, go, download all the images, and then render. Now keep in mind that this browser came out in an era where we were using dialing. That is to say, very, very slow access to the internet. Right? So combine those two things together. Slow internet, and when you go to, a, to some web page, you see nothing until all the images are downloaded, and then you see something. Yes? This browser was used for before Internet Explorer? No, so Internet Explorer was actually a competitor that came out. So this and Internet Explorer were early, sort of the early browsers. So this came out of Berkeley, and then uh, I believe Microsoft then came up with a product. I, if your question is which came first, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that Netscape and Explorer were always competing with each other. I just don't know when the competition started. Uh, um, so, that algorithm sucks. Can anyone offer a better alternative? Download the sizes first. Get the size of the image first. Okay, but that's the, okay. So let's explore this. So we'll move on, but let's explore this. How do you get the size of the image? Lookup table. Locally? Lookup look table. Where is that table stored? Where are the pictures stored? Okay, so what that means is that you first have to download the HTML, understand which pictures you want, then make another request to the lookup table, according to your algorithm, right? To then receive the size. So you're still doing two round trips, right? Not bad. Better than this. Better than downloading an entire image, right? but still kind of slow because remember, every access out to the server takes a while because we're using that. Get the size of the HTML. <laughs> no. uh, when you uh, like load, load the text first, yeah. then when you do the image, like do like lines of the images to load that, or maybe pixelated the images, like pixelated the images. So, okay, so forget HTML. Imagine I give you these. I found another use for these. Oh, they're different sizes. Perfect. Okay, so that. I give you this, right? I say, I want you to lay them out perfectly so they're side by side. And, but you don't know the size of this one. And you don't know the size of that one. No, you know what? I, I say there are going to be two more that are going to be between these two and those two, but I'm not going to tell you the size. Lay it out. You need to keep metadata with every image Good, good. Okay, so that's certainly one thing that can be done. In the HTML tag, in the image tag, we can say with whatever height, whatever. So even though we may not have the image that is loaded inside, very good you at least have an understanding of, okay, the image is going to be this size. And then when it loads, we simply draw the pixels in that box. Excellent, that's, that's very good. Suppose I don't have that though. Suppose, because in HTML you can just do image source, right? What do we do then? Can anyone offer a solution? So, like, then, then when you load the image, like, open them up? So, change the layout? I was breaking down the paging blocks and then putting Okay, so that that's so you're so you're suggesting that we lay it out again. You're suggesting a mechanism by which the layout algorithm could run based on maybe some sort of blocking system. Okay, very good. Uh, anyone else? The answer is exactly that. The answer is to lay it out again. It's that simple. So the idea is this, we render the page as soon as we get it, with only what we have. Later, when we get more information, we simply do it again. We update, okay? Now, the, the mechanism by which we lay things out is known as flow. 
Okay? Relayout is called reflow. Okay? So whenever the something inside of the structure changes, the structure by that I mean our HTML, whenever that structure changes because we download something else or something new, we reflow. We recompute the layout. Once the computation of the flow is done, we then spray the pixels that match that flow onto the screen. That's called paint. So we reflow, that is to say, recompute the layout, and we paint, in other words, redraw the new layout on the screen. With me? A question so far. This is really this is how browsers now work. So I want you guys to know that. Questions so far? Okay. One more thing. So once they could understand, they had this notion of reflow. This is where things get interesting. Once they had the notion of reflow, that is to say, they could change the structure of the HTML and they could update what you see. They realized something. They could introduce a scripting language. They could introduce a programming language into the browser that could modify the HTML. They already had a mechanism where once you modify the HTML, they reflow and repaint. So they had this problem solved, right? So the next thing was, could they have a programming language that could modify the structure as well? And that's where they decided to implement a scripting language in the browser that eventually became known as JavaScript. Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, so uh, that's how we got JavaScript. Yeah. So this is the typical flow, sorry, the typical set of steps that the Mosaic browser would use in order to, to download and render a page. So you begin with your address. We'll talk about specifically what this address looks like later, but for now just think facebook.com, okay? So you begin with an address. You fetch that address. That is to say, it makes an HTTP GET request that then goes out through the internet, gets routed around using the internet protocol, goes to Facebook or whatever, and then that then downloads, say, an HTML page. That is then cached. Let's stop right there. Hands up if you know what a cache is. Okay, so it's very simple. Think of it this way. Uh, I love books. And there is a great library next to Obera, everybody. I'm sure you guys know it. Anyway, it's kind of far though, right? So if I want to look something up, I can go over there to that library, get a book, bring it home, find the fact that I want, and then give the book away to a friend. And then if I want to know another fact, I can again go to the library, get the book, come back, look up the fact, go, ah, oh, interesting, okay, and then give it away to a friend. But here's the problem. Suppose I want to remember a fact that I had just looked up. I want to look it up again. Now I have to go again back to the library, get another book, come back, find the fact, and then give it away to a friend. Can anyone think of a better algorithm? Save the bomber, I think. Yeah, no, so, right, so I don't have to give the book away. Why don't I keep it, so that the next time I need information, I can just go to it and go, oh, just, you know, cool. Okay, so imagine, for this, I create a bookshelf. Right, so I have a nice bookshelf, it's about this high, you know. And I put books in it. So every time I go to a library for something new, I put in a bookshelf. If I want to look up a new fact, what's the first thing I do? Look in the bookshelf. Yeah, I first look in this bookshelf. Go, oh, is it here? If it is, it's going to save me a lot of time, right? Because I can just grab it, find it, put it back. If I can't, then I have to go to the library and get a book and bring it back. And then maybe add it to my local cache if you will. The bookshelf is my cache. If I can find what I want in the bookshelf or in my cache, that's known as a cache hit. Yes. 
If I don't find it, it's a cache miss. It's not there. So I go to the library, get another book, come back. Now, my bookshelf is of a certain size. So what I'm doing is great, but at some point, I'm going to fill up my bookshelf with books. Does anyone have a solution to this problem? Uh -huh. Okay, good, good. Wow, wow, you know your stuff. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. So the idea is, if the bookshelf fills up and I get another book, I need to make room for that book, right? So, what I, so I have to get rid of one of these books, take it out, give it to a friend, to create room for the new book. Now, there are lots of things, ways that I can decide which book to get, to get rid of. The simplest way is to simply say, what's the book that I've referred to last? Sorry, the least, the farthest back. Okay, uh, what's the book that I have not read in the longest amount of time? Think of it that way. The least used. The least used, yeah, that's the better way of saying it. The least recently used book. That's the one I can get rid of. And so the, the book that I just saw is definitely going to be in there. The book that I saw, wave, I can get rid of that. And then put that in. So the idea behind that algorithm, in other words, the decision of which book to get rid of, is so that the outcome maximizes the probability of getting a cache hit in the future. Exactly. I have a cache. I want to do whatever I can to make sure that I get a cache hit. Because a cache miss is expensive. I have to go all the way to the library. That's going to take a lot of time. So the algorithm for understanding how to organize these books is really important. Clear? Okay, so we all know what a cache is. It's a bookshelf. No. It's, it's somewhere locally where you store stuff when you get it. It's like a place you put to remember what happened so you don't have to go back. Good? So, if we... Yes, I'm sorry. Very good, very good question. So, what, and, and this has been said that one of, there are two, two or three like really hard problems in computer science, like really hard problems, actually in software engineering, not computer science. And one of them is how to cache properly. Because one of the biggest problems that happens is that the content that you cache or store can change. Again, going, through, going to that example, suppose you get a book from the library that you then store. A new version of that book comes out, but you still have the old version of the book in your bookshelf. That means in the future, if you want to learn something, you go and read the old information, which could be wrong, right? Imagine it's a textbook and new research came out and you know there's a whole new set of information out in the library that you don't have access to. So knowing when to expire the cache, that is to say, when to remove the book, is actually a really difficult problem. On the web, typically, the way this is done, is when content is sent to you, in the header, it says like when it should expire. So it says, you know, you keep this, but don't keep it for more than a month. That's a problem. Yes. It's a problem. So you would have to build another system, right? You might specify, create a notification system where the server sends you a message saying, hey, you know, this is a new content or whatever. But that problem that you just stated of having stale data, that is to say old data, is a, is a major problem in software engineering. Um, but it's, it's a, remember how I said you have to always account for the costs and the benefits. In this case, the benefit is that you save yourself round trip, right? You're not always going to the library. The cost is exactly this. It's the problem that you just need. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yes. So what if you, uh, like, say, say we for a month, and a month, uh, like a month later, uh, it should update, yeah, and there is no update. What so it's not going to update. What's going to happen is it's so next time it goes to read from the cache, it will look and go, oh, it's old. And what if the like new version doesn't exist? Then you'll go and get the same version again. Same yeah. Now that could be optimized where it could send a thing saying, hey, do you have a new version? 
right? So that you, because if the thing is big, it may not send, make sense to, right? So you can optimize the protocol, absolutely. Uh, other questions? Good, okay. Right, so back to this. So your browser will first get the address. It will then do a fetch, which is its process of getting the data, right? Where it does an HTTP get and it receives the response. It will then cache that data so that the next time the request is made, it doesn't go to the server again. It just has the data already and it can use it. Then it goes through a parsing phase. Parsing is the process by which we try to understand the structure of the file. So the file comes in as just a bunch of text. Well, it's bits, but you know, once you convert it to characters using ASCII, it then becomes text, right? HTML is stored as text. But we have to understand the structure in order to then draw it, in order to then lay it out. Um, so that's what the parser does. The parser then produces what's known as a parse tree or a syntax tree. It's just a data structure, which is a fancy way of saying just some code. Remember objects? We learned objects. Think of it as a bunch of objects that have information about the file. Once you have that, you then go through the process of flow. What is flow? Layout. Layout. Flow is layout. Okay? So it lays out, it tries to understand where things should go on the screen, the coordinates of each thing. Once it knows the coordinates, it then creates what's typically known as a display list. It's just information that says, put this at this x, this y, put this at this x, x, y, put this, at this, put this in this way, put this in this height. Right? It's the information you need to know how to put things on the screen. It then goes through paint where it then takes that, those instructions and puts them on the screen. Well, sorry, it then goes through the process and then the pixels is where you actually see it on the screen. So it's one long, and then you're there. That's it, it happens one time. But remember, later with Netscape, they figured out that you don't have to do this one time. This can happen again. This can happen again. Now this, this part here, comes after this. You see that? So that means this tree, which is just some data, can be modified. And when it's modified, that then triggers this path. Right? Now in JavaScript, we have access to this tree. It's known as the DOM. Fancy. It's known as the DOM. And it gives you access to the HTML structure in code. You, from your code, can modify that tree. And when you modify that tree, that then triggers possibly a flow if you changed the size of things, but certainly a paint because you might have changed the color of something, right? Or the text of something, or what have you. And so that will then trigger all this stuff, and the screen will update. So what this means is that from your JavaScript, you can change the HTML, and the page will update based on what you've changed. Make sense? Yeah. So that, we're going to be doing that very soon. right? We're going to be writing JavaScript in the browser that's going to change the stuff that you're seeing in the browser by modifying the tree, which again is known as the DOM. The document object model, don't worry about it, DOM. So whenever I say DOM, I'm referring to this tree. Clear? Yes. What about CSS? What about CSS? So that's a little different. So those are two slightly separate. So CSS is just more metadata attached to the tree. Yeah, yeah, so, right, right, so animations are just, again, hints on this. Now, underneath, there's, there are optimizations to figure out how to animate using the GPU instead of whatever. Don't worry about that, that doesn't matter. That's just implementation. But the point is, everything you just said is just more data attached to the tree that you can change using JavaScript. So you can add a CSS animation using JavaScript, you can delete a CSS animation using JavaScript. 
because it just is a property, nothing more. Make sense? Yes. Sorry, one more time. Yes. Oh, up here? No. Uh, this you can somewhat control from the server by changing like when it expires. So that kind of stuff you can do. But the rest of the browser will do. Fetch, you, you can specify the arguments that go to the fetch from the URL because depending on this, it's going to go here, right? So this you have control over. You don't have control over the parser. No. That's, that's an optimized thing that happens underneath, probably written in like C++ that happens very fast that smart people at Google or whatever wrote for you. So you're not going to touch that. Um, same thing with the flow algorithm. This right here is incredibly difficult. Layout is insanely hard to write and get it right. For a long time, browsers had lots of mistakes, but eventually they figured it out, and now they're, they're working pretty well. But this, this here, this part, is probably the hardest part out of all this. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, it's that, same thing. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Typically, yeah. Although both both have both a set of thing in the response. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's known as a denial of service attack or a DOS. Yeah. There there are ways to that's a whole different conversation. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. We'll talk about thinking. Okay, so uh, once we understand this stuff, I have a friend who's amazing at this stuff. Um, he will come. He will come. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions about this? Yes. Can you the Sure, absolutely. Very good question. Okay, so the question is this tree. There's some confusion about what exactly that is, okay? So if you read HTML, in fact, let's look at an HTML. Um, so, okay, so this here is the HTML, but it looks like a tree kind of, right? So you have the you know, doc type, you have your HTML. Underneath you have head and body. Inside of body you have like an input tag, a nav, a div. Inside of that you might have some stuff and so on and so forth, right? So HTML, if you think about it, when you're reading it, it's a tag within a tag within a tag, yes? So you can imagine it kind of looking like a tree, sort of, right? So this tree, oh, sorry, the tree I was referring to is just, it's a representation of that in your program. So in your program, we talked about variables, right? Imagine having access to a variable inside of which you have all the data about this. That's it. That's all you have to know. Yeah. That variable refers to that tree. It refers to a bunch of objects, which you have a node which has children, nodes which have children, and so on. And so it's actually a tree. Yeah. A tree is kind of our source. It's not a source. It's a. It's think of it as a variable inside of which you have uh, data, and that data is the issue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With different. Of course. Okay, very good question. Okay, so uh, hang on. Let's go back to our slide. One moment. Okay, so remember how I mentioned to you that consider how many algorithms are running here. There is a parsing algorithm. That is to say, the part that tries to read the text, the characters that you receive from the server, and attempts to turn that into a parse tree or representation of that content. That alone can have lots of optimizations. That is to say, for any algorithm, you can write it in different ways. 
Some are better than others. Some are faster than others, right? Then you have your flow algorithm. Getting that right and fast is very difficult. And different implementations, whether it's V8 inside of Chrome or what have you, implemented this algorithm slightly differently, right? So some are obviously going to be better at some things and worse than others. Uh, the algorithm to paint to pixels, I don't know if there's a huge difference here, although there might be. But the biggest thing I think is here, honestly. Yeah. Other questions before I, I move on? Okay. It's going to be a really interesting presentation, like right now, uh, that I think it's worth your time. Uh, basically, there's some really cool events coming up um, that relate to us, or I should say relate to our field. Um, and uh, so some really awesome people are going to be coming here, talking to you and telling you what are some of the events that are going to be happening. If you're curious, come. Um, so one of the biggest things I hope uh, to get you guys to do is to network. Um, go to events wh where other smart people go. I know it sounds very simple and primitive, but I'm serious. It's, it matters. Go to where other engineers go. Hang out with them. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Network, get them to know you. Remember one really important thing. Listen, listen. It doesn't matter how good you are if nobody knows how good you are. Remember that we live in a society, right? We, we work with other engineers, right? There are companies that we're going to be working with. There are clients that we're going to be working with. These entities have to know you. They have to know about you, right? Uh, they have to know that if they have this problem, they're going to call you because you are awesome and you know how to solve that problem. I know. <laughs> so really, don't take, I mean, networking is seriously a skill and it's something you have to do a lot. So go to where other smart people go. Okay, thank you.